Okay, so Richard, I, first of all, thanks for taking the time to let me ask you some questions because I think it's going to be a lot of fun. And secondly, if there's any question that you think you don't have an answer for, just make it up. It works better that way. Okay, that's great, Marks. Very good. And very, <laughs> very nice to talk to you. Is there any way we can stop these things from making a noise, uh, Ricardo? Sorry, I shouldn't just be saying no, this. You're good. No, we can't. We can't. No, that's, oh, actually, why, why don't I I'll close my inbox? That will stop it, won't it, actually? Uh, so close the inbox. Still got this guy. Okay, very good. Um, <clears throat> right, over to you, sir. Okay, so what I want to find out from you is what is the 80-20 and what's not the 80-20? The 80-20 principle. What is the 80-20 principle? I've never been asked that question before. <laughs> so that's kind of a very easy first first ball for me. Uh, the whole idea behind 80-20 is that uh, there are a few things usually which are very important in any distribution of events or data or our own lives. And there are a whole pile of other stuff which are, are not important. Not important, that is, in terms of results. So. The 80-20 principle was discovered, although not named, by Vilfredo Pareto, uh, an Italian economist working in Switzerland, in Lausanne University. And he was looking at data for the distribution of wealth and also the distribution of income in England in the 19th century. And he was writing in 1896, and the data he had were from uh, the earlier in the century. And what he noticed was that there was a linear relationship between the proportion of wealth, an inverse relationship, that is, between the proportion of wealth and the proportion of people. So to use the popular uh, term, which he never did, 80% of the wealth or 80% of the income uh, went to 20% of the population, and the population being people who were earning, them, excluding all dependents and so forth. Uh, and then he sort of looked at that and said, well, even within the 20%, which generated 80% of the wealth, there was the same kind of relationship. So even amongst the very high earners or the very high wealthy people, uh, there was always a subset of people where 20% of the of the 20% or 4% were actually uh, collaring 80% of the income or wealth. And you could draw, and in fact, he did draw a straight line uh, through the distribution. He used algebra to explain it um, rather than having any fancy graphs or, or anything like that. But, but nevertheless, he was struck by the fact that there was this, what we would call today a power law, the 80-20 distribution. And he then went and looked at the uh, data for France and Italy and Spain and any other country where he could lay his hands on the data. And lo and behold, the same pattern, not necessarily the same absolute level, not at all the same absolute level, but the same pattern actually applied. And then he looked at previous centuries and indeed the same thing happened. That the, that the data were very, very robust in showing that most wealth went to relatively few people and it was a reliable and um, uh, universal phenomenon. Now, what earthly use is that? Well, I have found in my life that, that if you look at businesses, you will find that 20% of pro uh, products or 20% of customers or 20% of technologies or 20% of, in some cases, people, generate 80% of the profits. And if you know that, it's often quite difficult to get the definition right, uh, because uh, you need to look at profits and not sales, and you need to look at the segmentation of the business, because sometimes products are in different segments, sometimes multiple products are in the same segment. But nevertheless, if you get it right, you will find that there is a very strong relationship where a very few products generate a, a very large majority of profits. And in fact, in many cases, a small number of products generate a very large proportion of losses. So you can have this slightly odd situation where 20% of products may generate more than 100% of profits because there are loss makers offsetting those. And if you know that, then you've 
can concentrate on the products or the customers which are generating that huge amount of profit. And okay, so, yeah. So let me interject real quick if I can, Richard. So two things. Number one, so what, right? What does that really mean for the business or for the individual? And number two is, so so if the 80-20 is a disproportionate relation between input and output, then what is not 80-20? And then the third question is, because I've seen people get a lot of trouble with 80-20 principles. I've seen guys in quote unquote certain spaces of marketing, what have you, implement the 80-20 in their life and their business and then go broke and or lose money. So why would that be the case? Well, it could be the case because uh, you need to look at things over time as well as a an, an, uh, snapshot in time. And it could be that there are new products or there are new customers who are unprofitable at the moment, uh, but will become very profitable in the future. And I suspect that a mechanical application of 8020 may be behind people going bust. I think also they may have just defined the segments wrongly. Uh, that's something which I see, see very often. Um, and just to go back to the first question, which was, so what? Well, <laughs> so what? Uh, you really, if you're, if you're interested in profit, if you're not interested in profit, that's fine. Then you don't need the 80-20 principle. But if you are interested in profit, and most of us are in business anyway, then, then you really do, do need to know that. There was a second question you asked, which I've forgotten. Could you just go back to the second question? Yeah, so what does that mean for the individual himself? For the individual themselves, well, the individual is probably generating a huge amount of output in a very small amount of time. And, you know, when you look at creative people, certainly, artists or uh, indeed people in business or people in any field, you will find that a relatively small proportion of their output generates nearly everything in terms of impact on the world. And this is why we, you know, one reason anyway, why we've reduced working hours uh, by well, a factor of two or three over the last hundred years. And we still have a huge increase in wealth because the time that you spend to do something is a very, very bad indicator of the value. And so if I'm talking to an individual, whether we're thinking about their work or whether we're thinking about their life outside work, I always try and say, well, what are the times that you are the most productive or what are the times that you are the most happy and fulfilled? What is it that actually generates a huge amount of value for other people as well as satisfaction for yourself? And very often... Let me yeah. So let me inter interject, and I hope you don't mind me stopping because <clears throat> there's you say so much great stuff and it spawns certain questions along the way. So two things. One is, is it easy? In other words, is it easy for anybody to step back and look at their input or their working life and figure out what is the vital few things that they do that makes the biggest difference, number one. And number two is, you know, somebody once made a comment about sure the bird i think it was on uh, one of your on the 80 20 principle book about sure that you know the meat is the 20 percent, but without the bun you don't have the hamburger yeah. so if we pull that individual out and say you can't do these things anymore because they're a waste of your time focus on these things doesn't that then kind of get that person in trouble because then they still won't be able to execute or do the things that have to get done even though those things are of low value well Low value, yes. I mean, I think that it's it would be a very strange world if we just did the few things <laughs> which generate the huge amount of value. I mean, where where is um, looking at the flowers? Where is walking the dog? Where is fiddling around with your carburetor if you like cars? You know, where is reading great books or even, dare I say it, and I, I, I don't actually like television myself, but entertainment, you know, watching, watching sure. television, I prefer the movies. But, 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 you know, you could not possibly live in a situation in which you were generating a huge amount of value all of the time. But the point, Marx, is that that is completely unnecessary. We do a lot of things at work which are very, very frustrating. 
and we do a lot of things which don't add very much value. We do a lot of things which we're not fulfilled doing, nearly all of us. And the point is that if you know what the few things are that generate enormous value, you don't have to do the other stuff. I mean, I often say to myself, you know, what's the one thing that if I've done it today, it will add a lot of value and then I can take the rest of the day off. And how quickly can I do that? Now, you know, I actually like a lot of my work. I actually like writing books, for example. I actually like making investments and thinking about things. But, you know, I also like going and playing tennis. I also like riding my bicycle. I also like walking the dog. And so the point is, if you can find the few things which you do which are very, very valuable, and you know they're very, very valuable, then you don't have to do all the other crap. And you can certainly have, you know, you can have it all. You can have a, a relatively relaxed, calm, um, in control work life, and you can have a very nice life as a whole. And it is definitely true that uh, it's very important to feed the creativity. And, you know, feeding creativity is getting lots of inputs. It, it is actually maybe watching a movie or reading a book or talking to people or just thinking yourself. You know, it is going for a bicycle ride. It's even playing tennis, I think. You know, and if you do those things, you are more likely to produce the, the very high value. But I haven't answered your first question, which is, is it easy to actually find the few things that you do which add enormous value? And the answer to that question is, no, it's very hard. It's very difficult. Um, because we're not used to thinking in terms of units of output. We're not used, to, we're actually used to wasting a lot of our time. This is why I always say that, you know, there's no shortage of time because we use it so badly that, that you know, if we just used it a bit more sensibly, we'd have masses and oodles of time. But it's, it's not, it's not uh, very easy to know what it is that you add value, which is, um, you know, which, which, which doesn't take very much time. Other people can often tell you that. Um, I mean, for example, there are some people whose main contribution at work, they tend to be higher up in the company and they might be the chief executive, but the, the main value is actually making a decision. And that's one of the great things that human beings can do. And as far as we can tell, other animals can't, which is make a decision which goes against previous practice or against what many people think is, a, is the right way of doing things. So it may well be that the decision that you made last week to hire somebody or indeed to fire somebody who was either adding a, a huge amount of value or would add a huge amount of value or was subtracting a huge amount of value, that one decision may be the most important thing that you have done in the last month. And, you know, I don't know how long it takes to make decisions, but I suspect it doesn't take all that long. Uh, I suspect we do most things by intuition. No doubt we'll get some data and all the rest of it. But thinking about what new product could Apple introduce after Steve Jobs went back into Apple in 1997. They had a situation where there were a huge number of products. You remember, you know, they had the Newton handwriting recognition stuff. You know, that was fascinating, but it was actually didn't work very well and nobody, nobody bought it. So it was a bit of a waste of time. Really. The only thing which was profitable was the, the old Macintosh. And so they cut out all the rest, but that's very well, you know, what do you do then? for an encore. And it took three years before Apple figured out what to do. And of course, it was iTunes and it was the iPod initially and all the other devices that came after that. Just thinking about which projects to prioritize and making a correct decision on that added literally tens or hundreds of billions of dollars value to Apple. And so, you know, that's an example where it's easy to say it with the benefit of hindsight, but that generically, you know, what is going to be the next blockbuster in terms of profit 
that your company is going to introduce? Or what is it that you are going to do personally, which is going to create an enormous amount of value? Many of the... But isn't that... Yeah. Sorry, but so let me just kind of jump in real quick. But isn't that also the... Isn't it the 80-20 principle only applying to certain people? In other words, there's a book called The Requisite Society by Elliot Jacques. <clears throat> and he says that the world should be put like a pyramid. And he says that the majority of the bottom can only see one or two days ahead. And as you go up the pyramid, right, there's a lesser number of people and they have a longer vision. And that the person at the top of the pyramid can see out 10, 15, 20 years ahead. And, and by the way, it has nothing to do with IQ because sometimes, you know, cancer scientists at the very bottom of the pyramid, because if they don't think about solving cancer today, they wouldn't go to work, right? It's it different. Isn't the 80-20 principle applied to individuals that way, the ditch digger who works digging ditches every day for eight, nine, 10 hours a day really can't dig ditches, you know, any more efficiently or faster. And he may not want to. So isn't it somewhat, um, I guess, exclu not exclusive or elitist, but isn't it segmented that only a few number of people, because the CEO who thinks about the idea still needs to impact it or put it into effect. And he's not going to do it. But the other folks who are need to devote seven, eight, nine, ten hours a day and making that happen. Yes, absolutely. I mean, you're, you're absolutely right. I'm a great fan of Elliot Jakes. I think he's okay. dead by now, but he was a, he yeah. was a great Canadian. I think he was Canadian, wasn't he? He was, he was a great guy. He came up with the phrase time span of discretion. And his yes. argument was that the... The greatest value is added by people whose decisions, you don't know whether they're right or wrong in the longest possible period of time. So in other words, you know, a new product introduction, it might be 10 years, it could even be 100 years before you actually know whether the thing is fantastically successful or not. Uh, whereas a decision to switch a light on and off, you know, you know straight away. So, right. so, you know, his argument was uh, that you should pay people according to the time span of discretion. The only trouble with that is that for the people at the top, it was a wonderful charter because if you didn't know whether they're going to be successful, you continue to pay them hundreds of millions of dollars for years until you found out that they weren't actually geniuses after all. So, it, you know, I mean, I, I never thought that it was actually a terribly good tool for thinking about uh, how you pay people. But I think as a, as a conceptual, um, as, a, as a thought as to, you know, where the value is, and I think he was absolutely right. And I, oft, I used to think not just about people digging ditches, but I used to think about, you know, a bus conductor, you know, basically one hour is as valuable as another hour. You, he has to, he yes. used to have to collect the fares, he used to have to smile at the customers, he used to ring the bell to start the bus, all of those things that you don't do anymore. But for also for a bus driver, you know, one day was the same as another day. The point about progress, however, is that we make progress as a, as a nation, we make progress as a society, we make progress as individuals, when we elevate ourselves from the things which don't really follow the 80-20 principle to those that do. We elevate ourselves where we have discretion and are not basically animals uh, proceeding on tram lines or proceeding by instinct as we always have done. And so the 80-20, yes, it is true. I, 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 don't, I don't actually make any apology for the fact that the 80-20 principle in a way is elitist. The only thing I would say is that, is that it is open to all of us as individuals to move up the time span of discretion chart, to move up the 80-20 chain, if you like, and say, well, let's do things which are not uh, repetitive and are not predictable and which are not tied to time in order to measure impact or value. Let's move up the chain and actually think about the things that we can do individually, which are more creative and which are not bound by a certain predictable measure of value for a predictable measure of time. And so therefore, you know, everyone, I believe, has great potential creativity. You see it in the most odd places. Some of the most creative and successful people in the arts, even in business, in, in um, philanthropy, 
and in terms of social impact generally, are people who came from very, very modest backgrounds. I remember reading a book about Albert Einstein. I've been, been uh, researching people for a new book, which, as you know, I'm writing. And, you know, Einstein was reckoned to be a dunce. I mean, he couldn't speak at the age of three or four. He was called the dopey one by the maid uh, of, of the, of the uh, house. He came from a long line of people who were essentially very small business people, uh, not particularly successful, not particularly wealthy, not, not poor, but nevertheless, not with any trace of academic or other intellectual distinction. I mean, it, it's just amazing. And of course, everyone thinks that Einstein, well, he, he was a natural genius, but it didn't appear that way. He had very bad record in school. His mathematics sucked. You know, I mean, this is, this is the guy who made the, made the greatest discovery and probably the greatest single scientific value added in the 20th century. You know, nuclear power uh, and indeed bad things like nuclear bombs. Our whole understanding of how to go into space and so on and so forth absolutely depended upon his theory of relativity. And, you know, so... You know, he was employed like, a, a, like someone digging a ditch or like a bus conductor, slaving away as the third class patent office reviewer of new inventions in Bern, Switzerland. And that was what his job was. He was doing that for uh, uh, ostensibly eight hours a day, six days a week. But of course, he then got all of his work done in the first two hours and spent the remaining six hours <laughs> thinking, yeah, thinking about relativity, reading everything that he could lay his hands on, papers, books, you know, everything by Leonard, everything by uh, all the people who, uh, Maxwell, you know, the people who discovered about magnetism. You know, he basically spent all his time reading and, uh, and thinking. And, th and that, therefore says that, you know, someone who couldn't get a job as a teacher, let alone as a professor, after he graduated, you know, was able to elevate himself up that chain. And if he could do it, because he wasn't reckoned to be all that bright, you know, there's hope for everyone. So, you know, it's elitist, but it's, it's not exclusive. You know, anybody can do it. And the whole point of progress is actually to move up that span of discretion or the 80-20 chain. So then would you say that the 80-20, although not exclusive, but elitist, really only goes to those who are ambitious? Well, I think you can apply 80-20 to softer things. It doesn't have to be people who want to change the world. It could be that people actually want to be happy and to have an impact on the people around them, which makes other people happy. Who is to say that that is not a more valuable thing to do than even inventing the iPod? Okay, so then how would you define progress? Because you've mentioned that word several times. And so how do you define progress? Well, I think progress has to be defined, or progress, as I was calling it, it has to be defined in terms of uh, either economic terms or in terms of um, what, what generates well-being. And, you know, it's quite easy to measure money. It's very hard to measure well-being. But, you know, if someone, for example, invents penicillin and as a result, you know, mortality from flu and from various other diseases or battle wounds goes down dramatically, then I think that is... That's progress. I mean, that's worth billions and billions of dollar equivalents in terms of uh, in terms of impact on the world. And if you think about raising children, I'm I'm gay and I'm not married, obviously. Well, not obviously, but I'm not married. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm gay. It's an option now. Uh, but uh, you know, I think that the the biggest thing that anyone can do is have an impact, a a good impact, that is, on their children. 
Now, you know, there are various debates which say, well, actually, children are, you know, they come out of a factory and it's very unpredictable. You know, one child might be, uh, you know, a very amenable and pleasant personality, engaging personality, and the brother or sister might be someone that uh, is going to develop into a sociopath. But, you know, there there is a strong genetic influence, but there's also a strong influence from whether people feel loved, whether people have a good environment, which is testing, uh, but also provides safety and uh, and love. You know, so to me, anyone who says someone who actually maybe doesn't have a job and doesn't have any ambition in the world of work, but nevertheless raises a family and raises uh, children who feel secure, you can influence that, you can't control it. But nevertheless, influencing it is hugely valuable. And so, you know, what one has to reckon with is that everyone that lives has an impact on other people. And then if you have an impact on person A, who might be your son or your daughter, then they are going to have an influence on the next generation and also on the people that they interact with. They are going to make people feel shitty or feel great. And so, you know, to me... That is hugely important. Happiness is hugely important. Now, happiness, as I wrote in the 80-20 principle, actually does follow the 80-20 principle. You know, there are things that you do which command the majority of your time, which most people don't actually enjoy very much. There are people that you work with who are poison, or there are people you work with who are magic. You know, it doesn't take a genius to work out who's who in that particular zoo. And it doesn't take a genius to then say, well, actually, I'm not going to work with people that don't enhance my happiness and my creativity or whatever it is that's important to you. And I'm not going to work at something that pays a lot of money but makes me unhappy. So, you know, just thinking carefully about what is the balance between the decision you make and the output in terms of time or in terms of results is very important. And you can use the 80-20 principle to, to think about that. You know, so if, if I wasn't straight, I'd be totally gay, Richard. <laughs> I, <laughs> and yes. having, you know, having raised with my, you know, with my, my wife, because she did most of the work, three kids, I agree with you. I mean, you know, no matter how much money and millions and tens of millions we've made, Raising our three kids has been and still is our greatest happiness and joy. And, and, and I love nothing more than hanging out with them, right? So I understand the happiness. And I do think that happiness and productivity or progress, as you called it, are, can be one and the same. And so here's, so here's another question. We're assuming that the individual who's applying this 80-20 principle, right, whether in business or in happiness, has a presupposition that they already know what they want, right? So if they don't know what they want, can they still apply the eighty twenty principle? No, of course they can't. <laughs> okay. No, you have to. You have to know. Yeah, but but indeed, the eighty twenty principle can at least raise the question, uh, or at least reading the book could raise the question, rather than the principle. The book and the principle are not exactly the same thing, obviously. You know, raise right. the principle of. You know, getting people to think about that, and and you don't need to read a book about eighty twenty to to uh, be prompted to think about that. You can think about that as a result of a conversation that you have, or or an article you read in the newspaper, or something you see on television, or a book, another book that you you read. But it is very important to think about those things because, you know, the impact that you have on other people is terribly important, and you can be sure that you are not thinking about that and I am not thinking about that as much as, as we should. So, okay, so, you know, in your life thus far, right, you you mentioned, I think, when you were seven or eight, you wanted to be a millionaire when your aunt asked you, and at whatever age, I think it might have been seven or eight, and then you go work, you know, BCG and, and uh, Bain and all these, you know, shell company, and then eventually you found the LEK or one of the founders of LEK, and you worked all the hours that God gave you you then sell your business, I think it was for four or five million pounds, whatever it was. So here's here's the question, right? Can somebody say, oh, Richard, easy for you to say, you worked your butt off until age 40, whatever, when you sold it, found a few million pounds, but you would have never been able 
to accumulate the income you did and the expertise you did in order to make the decisions of what companies to invest in the network you built if you hadn't worked all the hours that God gave you. So isn't there something to be said for the rocket ship, meaning that in the beginning, you know, when you're starting something, you've got to pour all the hours that you can in a day. you got to work with your heart for very little progress. As the rocket ship takes off, then you can kind of pull back on the throttle and now you can fly high. So would you have been as successful if you had not worked so hard early in your life? I think I would have been more successful. Uh, and th let me try and explain why I think that's true. It is true. I mean, I will concede that it is true that if you start a business, you do need to devote an enormous amount of energy to that. And I think that the energy is more imp the energy and the quality of the thinking is more important than the time. But I know very, very few people who start a business and don't work all the hours that God sends, etc. But I will tell you this, uh, Marx. Ever since I was in my late twenties, I made a point of exercising at least for an hour each day and doing something that I enjoyed, uh, which might be cycling or might be playing tennis or it might be even walking or hiking, whatever. And when I started, co-started LEK, I made it a rule that I would not deviate from that and that I would always spend some time relaxing during each day and that I would try to avoid working at weekends as well. Now, the truth is, I was thinking about the business all the time. I was obsessed about the business. I was actually, you know, devoting more than 100% of my psychic energy to the business. And that's, that's definitely true. It's not the same thing, though, as devoting all your time and becoming very unproductive. When I worked at the Boston Consulting Group in my late, mid to late 20s, I was a failure. I actually didn't do analysis as well as other people. And I was quite shocked to discover that um, my other talents were not fully appreciated. And um, so what I did was exactly what you were talking about five minutes ago, which is I redoubled my efforts I worked 80 or 90 hours a week. I totally neglected my relationship and friends. I, I became absolutely devoted to making myself successful, doing something that I would never be good at doing. And I failed. And so was that a good investment of time and effort? No, it wasn't. There's nothing wrong with working all the hours that God sends if you want to, if you enjoy doing that or you're getting some kind of psychic satisfaction and return from that and you're being successful. But the sad thing is that many people work unbelievably hard. They never get rich and they never will get rich because they're doing the wrong thing. And the wrong thing is what other people are doing is what they are not good at doing and it, it is not using the very skewed um, abilities, the very unique abilities that each of us has. And so therefore it's much more important to think about what those unique attributes are and what you can do that other people really appreciate and that you, know, that you add a huge amount of value to. And preferably what you can do in relatively short period of time to do that. Because we are not meant to work 80 or 90 hours a week. I don't know anybody who actually, looking back on their life, you know, says, the biggest mistake I made in my life was that I didn't work hard enough. In, uh, work, work, and work hard is a very um, weasel phrase, I think. You know, when people talk about working hard, they usually mean working long hours. Whereas I think the most important thing is thinking hard, which actually may require us to be relaxed and to have plenty of spare time and plenty of opportunity to reflect. And as LEK became more successful, I found myself spending more and more time thinking. And I, you know, I would go for walks, I would, you know, increase the amount of time I spend on exercise from one hour a day to three hours a day. I'd think very hard about the interventions which we were making with our client companies. And I would think very hard about, but you know, who was who was most effective and what were they doing? 
But those things were not the conventional definition of working hard. They were thinking hard. And so therefore, you know, I think it, it's, it is wrong to think that su successful people are successful because they work hard. Many successful people may work hard, but many unsuccessful people work hard as well. The, the people who are successful are those who are successful at thinking hard, which is, which is difficult, but nevertheless does, okay. not, does not take a huge amount of time and does not destroy the soul. So, okay, so I, I define thinking properly for me. And then the other thing is that, you know, if you're sitting there thinking hypothetically for eight hours a day, isn't that even harder than just typing away at data entry for eight hours a day? Oh, you can't think for eight hours a day. You absolutely can't. I mean, it, the different people are different. I mean, that maybe Albert Einstein could, but I can't. And I don't know anybody who can actually. Uh, right. You know, I, you, know, you, you can only think hard for about, well, you know, as I say, I run out of gas at about one hour or two hours maximum. And I need to go and recharge my batteries. And then, you know, you get, you get the product of, of your thinking. You set up the, the unconscious mind to work out what, you know, what's, what result you want. And then you go and do something and you get the answer when you're shaving or when you're cycling or when you're playing tennis right. even. So I think it's very, you know, thinking hard is not an unpleasant experience. It's just something that you need to get in the habit of doing. It's not easy. It's, 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 it is hard. But it's not unpleasant. Uh, once you get into the habit of doing it, it's one of the most gratifying things that you can do to come up with an idea which will save time, save money, or generate a huge amount of, of enjoyment for people or generate a huge amount of money. It's very enjoyable. But it is, it's not easy. You need to train yourself to do it. But nevertheless, it's completely different philosophy from saying that, that you know, hard work is important. I, I love Ronald Reagan's quote, which he said... It's true that hard work never killed anyone, but I figure, why take the risk? And actually, <laughs> Reagan was a very good president, and he was one of the laziest presidents around. You know, I think it's, uh, there's a lot to be said for laziness, as long as you're serious about adding value. So, okay, so then this, describe what, what is thinking exactly, right? Because we're throwing out this term of, you know, you need to think hard. Okay, so what does that really mean? How, what does that look like? What happens inside the brain when someone thinks right? You know, nobody knows the answer to that question. Um, I don't know the answer to that question, and I've never... It's a very good question, and I ask a lot of people that question. What is thinking? I really don't know. I mean, I can describe how you are likely to make progress in thinking, but actually what the process is, nobody knows. I mean, the process is totally mysterious. It's unique to human beings. Neuroscientists have tried to, to um, you know, done amazing research in the last three decades but they still can't answer the question. What, what, you know, how is a new idea generated? They can't do that, you know. And all I will say is that you're more likely to be productive in thinking if you know a great deal about a subject and you think very hard from what I call first principles. And people don't understand what first principles are. You know, what that means is you, you, you take whatever information you've got and then you say... You know, well, if we want to, if we want to get an answer which is ten times better than the answer we got at the moment, you've got to start with an, a, a hypothesis. You've got to start with a question, which is, you know, what's important. So you you define your hypothesis or your hypotheses, and then you think, well, what would I need to know in order to prove or disprove the hypothesis? And that's basically the scientific method, and it's exactly the method that, that uh, strategy consultants used in Boston Consulting Group and in Bain and Company in particular, you know, and in LEK. You know, it, it's actually saying, you know, what is important? It's actually applying the 80-20 principle without perhaps knowing that you're applying the 80-20 principle. So you say, what's important? What, what is the objective function? What are we trying to do? And what method or what clue can we get to mean that we can find a way to the answer which is 10 times as effective or 10 times as enjoyable or whatever than uh, than the current best practice how do we make a huge leap forward 
and you ask that question and you think about it. And as I say, you try and think from, from first principles, building on what you know, and then trying to say, well, what don't we know that if we knew it, we could take a huge leap forward? And it's, it's, um, it's, it's not a complicated process. You sit down, I sit down, you know, on my fish pond or outside in the sunshine, preferably. It's been raining all day here, so I'm quite grumpy today. But you, you sit down and you, and you take a piece of paper. You, I don't do it on the computer. And you say, well, what do we want to know? You know, and you just think about that. <laughs> and then you say, well, generate some hypotheses. And then you generate some hypotheses. And then you say, well, what do, you know, what information do we need in order to decide whether the hypothesis is correct or not? And sometimes you have to do some analysis, but a lot of the time, all you have to do is think about it and think what is likely to be the answer. Um, and um, that's how you make a big breakthrough. So, it, you, so know, you literally think on paper, Richard? Yes, I think on paper. Um, I write things down, but of course... The writing down is not the thinking. The writing down is prompting the thinking. Okay, so what's easier, thinking or doing? Well, sometimes doing can be easier uh, because, you know, I think intuitively we often come up with the answer and we, we then think about, well, you know, I've been incredibly effective. Take, for example, trying to persuade a customer to buy a very expensive product. You can think about that, and I wouldn't reject thinking about it, but very often you can try it out. You can say, well, you know, what do I know about this customer and what do I know about their hot buttons, what they're likely to react positively to? And how can I genuinely and honestly interest them in something which they're very interested in anyway? And... You know, and then you think about the interaction afterwards. Sometimes you're successful in selling whatever you want to sell. Most of the time you're not. And then you just think about, well, what's the difference between the times that I have been very successful and the times that I haven't been? And again, it's, it's all 80-20 it's all type thinking. You know, you just divide the, the, uh, the world into what's effective and what isn't, what produces results and what doesn't, and you divide that by the effort that you're requiring. So very often, you don't know something unless you talk about it, and it's quite interesting. You know, you, you can think your way to a solution, but I find that I need to talk to people, um, not necessarily very many people, but some people who are also interested in the same issue or problem or opportunity, and are also people who have got some... Uh, ability to think in a creative way and so yeah very often you do things and then you get the answer but then you have to think about why did you get the answer and therefore how can you replicate that in the future now these things are, that I'm talking about here are though they are so simple but I haven't read a book by anybody and I haven't seen a lecture by anybody, I haven't seen anything on YouTube by anybody, really trying to explain how you think in that way. And so, you know, I mean, one of the things that I do after the book, which I'm writing at the moment, is I'm thinking, well, maybe I could write that book, a book about how you think in, in a very methodical but very creative way, and also act, as you say, because often you it's better to act because when you act, you discover things that you wouldn't discover otherwise. When you have a conversation, you have a thought which you wouldn't have otherwise. You can't do that totally in isolation. You, I mean, I believe in, in sort of sitting down in a, you know, a very peaceful place and thinking about things from first principles. But I also believe in, in talking to people and having the sort of discussion which we're having at the moment. You come up with ideas because the other person prompts an idea, and that is, that's the way to operate. But you need to be, again, as with everything in the 80-20 principle, you need to be very selective because there are certain people who are much better at that than others. And so, you know, you want to talk to the people who are more creative and more likely to spark your creativity. But it's not difficult to know whether that's happening or not. 
And, you know, many, many times we just tend to go to the same people because they're the same people, but the people who are easiest, most accessible, people we've known for a long period of time. It, it very often is the case that we need to go beyond that and find someone else who's more creative. And then, you know, it's not too difficult to try and work out who might be suitable for that and to engage them in some, in some joint thinking. So could it be that, you know, there's a book, I think, by Till Compernole called Brain Chains. He studied the brain for about six years. And, you know, it's kind of a dry, bit of a dry book if you can get through it. But he breaks the brains into three parts, right? The caveman brain, which is the limbic system, you know, the amygdala, all that stuff, right? The fight flight. Then the neocortex, which he calls the thinking brain. And then he calls the subconscious mind, so the archiving brain. And he proves, you know, based on science that when the when the neocortex is active or the amygdala is active, the archive your brain, the subconscious mind is less active. And therefore the subconscious is more active when you sleep and what have you. And he says that these the subconscious mind, the archive your brain, takes all these memories, all these thoughts, all these ideas, and files them like a librarian. And then when you then ask the subconscious mind for an answer, it will figure out how things that are unrelated relate to each other and come back and say, here's these four files. And if you put them this way, it creates a new idea, i.e. to talk about the idea that you had in, uh, in the book, the Walkman was the elimination of the speakers, right? You know, th these things that, that seem unrelated become somewhat related. So could it be? that when you're thinking and you're looking for more information, that you're accumulating data so that the brain can somehow find ways to relate those pieces together that have not yet been related to create something new or a new idea or a new hypothesis? That's exactly how it works. I mean, you sent me a copy of that book. I couldn't get into yes. it. I, I actually, I tried hard. You know, it, it just... <laughs> It actually, I tried too hard, you know, it actually annoyed me a bit because I thought, yeah, some, some of it makes sense, but I just didn't see the connections. You've explained it in two minutes in a way that, that you know, I couldn't do after reading the book for 20 or 30 hours. So, so yes, I mean, <laughs> but the whole idea of relating things that are unrelated or have not been related is behind, you know, breakthroughs of all kinds. I mean, that's been very well documented. Uh, and creative. creative people are people who, who, I hate the phrase, think outside the box, but they are people who have collected a lot of data or a lot of soft thinking, and somehow they managed to combine that. But it needs to be done within a bounded area. You know, I do, I do believe that it's, it's great to say, yes, you need to relate unrelated things, but you need some expertise which can sort the wheat for the chaff with both types of idea. So uh, I, I'm a great believer in focus and I'm a great believer in the opposite. Because, because things are non-linear, but they still have to be directed? Yes, I think that's a good way of putting it. Got it. So for, the, for those who have companies, we talked earlier in the beginning about the 80-20 principle and you know, a few products, few services, few salespeople create most of the profit and then you know, conversely, you know, few products, people, services delete most of the profit, you know, and it's a, not a zero sum game. When we eliminate some things, productivity or profits go up. And when we add certain things, productivity or profits go up. Is there a sequence of eliminate first or add first? I don't think it matters, frankly. Uh, I think it can work either way. Interesting. And so if somebody's starting a business, and like, you know, one of my sons, right, he's got a, a $10 million business now. Well, $10 million valuation business, no revenue yet. He invented a biodegradable plastic, which is pretty interesting. So they're starting out. He has no quote unquote data, right, to look at. What should he, as an example, focus on to apply the energy principle to his business? I don't know, actually. It's a good question. Um, <laughs> I suppose you, you could say, well, He's got to have products and customers. So which products and customers are likely to be the ones which are most profitable? And he needs to have some hypotheses about that. Uh, he's in the very unfortunate, uh, no, very fortunate position of, of not having, not being uh, constrained by the data, as uh, someone once said, accused me of, of uh, making things up, basically. But that's, that's very helpful. I mean, that's, you know, I'm sure he must, I don't know, how does, how does he 
go about it. And I'm sure he's not sort of just waiting for some revelation from from um, from the universe to tell him that. How how is he going about? No, I mean, what's interesting as well, you know, he is a student of the eighty twenty principle, and you've talked to him a couple of times. So, you know, brilliant kid. They, I mean, they realize that the fastest, easiest thing they can do is create a small bag that jewelers use online to ship jewelry. Very easy for them to do with this biodegradable plastic, and so they're going to manufacture it. And, you know, they're going to do great. I'm only asking because in my world, um, there's a lot of people who are starting businesses that don't have data that say, hey, look, I can't apply the, the principle of the industry principle because I don't have any data. And the pie is also what you should at least think 80-20. And they don't know, they go, well, I don't have to think 80-20. So does it go back to, in the beginning, if somebody is starting a business or wants to start a business or, you know, doesn't have enough data, is it about more thinking, sort of like testing out the hypothesis and then getting feedback? Because don't we need to iterate? Don't we need to sort of get through all the junk to find the vital few? Sure, of course we do. I mean, I always say, if you haven't got data, get captar. And captar are basically things that you make up. Uh, and they're estimates, if you like. And, you know, I, th I think actually one of the things is, is that people who are very successful in business are very good at guessing. They're very good at estimating. And that goes totally against the sort of, you know, the trend of the last... 50, 60 years, which strategy consultants were part of, actually, which has culminated in things like big data, where, you, you know, you analyze things, you, you know, you torture the data, essentially, until it, until it gives you the answer. Well, you know, I'm not, I'm not a great fan of that, because it seems to me the more, more important questions may not be being asked, because there's no data. So the data, in a sense, constrains the thinking, rather than the thinking requiring the data and I think that's that's quite uh, dangerous so yes I think that if you don't know the answer and you haven't got the data then think where this kind of relationship between output and input can be very high and um, you, yeah no so you always talk about and I think people you know I think people get in trouble with the 80 20 principle be, at least from what I've seen because they begin to eliminate stuff from their life right in other words the guy's working or the girl's working 80 hours a week and so now he wants to work or she wants to work 20 hours and so they begin to eliminate but they don't substitute something that's more productive so isn't 80 20 less about doing quote unquote less things and more about figuring out you know what is the outcome that we want and how do we get there happily sure i mean of course i mean it, I mean, there are. I mean, it's it's not, it's not really very complicated. And it, you know, someone like Peter Drucker never used the expression. I don't think eighty twenty. But he was, he was always looking at results, and the eighty twenty thing supplies another lens, which says yes, results are very important, but inputs are very important too. So you need to look at where the input is relatively mild or small, whether the input is time or money or, or indeed the ability to think about something. And you need to think about what could be a fantastic outcome. So it's always this balance between what goes in and what comes out. And that's really all that 8020 is. It's just saying, think about the inputs and, and the outputs. And where is there a, a relationship where there's a fantastic output for a very, very modest input. And that's, you know, you can, you can do that without any data at all. And in fact, it's probably in, better in many cases not to have the data because the data, as I say, may constrain it because you only think about the things that you've got data for. Well, you know, that, that, that is not how progress is made. You know, progress is made by thinking things that haven't been thought before and therefore don't have any data about them. So do you walk around every day, your entire day, thinking what's 80-20, how do I 80-20 this? No, I don't, actually. I perhaps, <laughs> perhaps I should. <laughs> I'm not sure about that. So are you now in your routine more about habit and routine, or are you still pushing yourself as you know, Richard Koch individually to attain more progress? Where are you now? Oh, always the latter, always the latter. Yeah, I mean, I think it's death. Literally, death 
if you actually settle down and do routines. Now, I like routines and I like habits and good habits are great you know, and all the rest of it. Bad habits are terrible. But nevertheless, you've got to go beyond that. So I make myself do things that I don't really want to do sometimes, although I can choose to do whatever I want. And most people can, actually, outside of prison or a concentration camp or something. You know, so, so, you know, I think it is important to work out the things that you like to do, but sometimes it's important to do the things that you don't necessarily like in order to generate uh, new thoughts or new experiences. So you might want to hang out with people that are completely the opposite of you. You might sometimes want to travel somewhere that you don't really want to go. You might want to um, read something that you've never thought of reading before. You might want to uh, have a conversation with someone who you know, other people say are, are, you know, very, very interesting. And, but you're not interested at all in what they're interested in. But then you might discover that actually some of, some of what they're interested in relates in a, in a way that nobody's ever thought about before to some of the things that you're interested in. So I try and force myself sometimes to do things that I don't want to do. But most of the time, most of the time, I do try and think about how to generate exceptional results for relatively little effort. And that is that is something that I do routinely. But I don't do it consciously at this stage, I don't think. I don't actually sit down and say, you know, how do I 80-20 this? Sometimes I will, so that, but it's pretty rare. So does that mean that you'll get in the car, drive in traffic in a cloudy day, and talk to attorneys? <laughs> no, <across>? absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> there are limits, aren't there, Mark? There are limits. <laughs> And there's such a thing as stress, which is, you know, there are, there, some people think stress is, a certain amount of stress is good for you. And that, I read a book which says that, and it sort of makes intuitive sense. But certainly too much stress is not, is not good. And that's well, why, distress, distress, that's why right? you know, that's why some of the best discoveries are made when people have given up. And then they go out and, and uh, you know, do something which is fun. And then the answer comes, which is great. So, okay, so... I mean, difference between new stress and distress and pervasive stress versus just momentary stress, right? Yeah. I think we all get that, which is important. But let's finish up with, with this idea, because this is new, right? I, don't, I mean, I've never heard you say this before, that you will force yourself to do things, to stretch yourself that are somewhat uncomfortable or you may not like. And obviously, you have a purpose behind it, but tell me more about that. Why do you do that? How often do you do that? And under, like, under what circumstance? In other words... Does that mean that you're going to go play a, a tennis player who's way better than you? Or does that mean that you're going to go read a book on botany, which you have no, no interest in? It usually comes from a person. In other words, you know, I think one of the easiest things to do to do something that you haven't done before is to find somebody that you like who likes doing some of the things that you do, but also likes doing some of the things that you don't like doing. And then you feel comfortable because you feel comfortable with the individual and you say, well, you know, I don't want to climb a mountain, but you're going to climb a mountain. And so I'll come along and climb a mountain with you or whatever. And as long as they're prepared to let you do that, then that's probably the easiest thing. I mean, the, the, the way that I make progress is by meeting people who, not many people, but people that, that you know, uh, actually have overlap, but also are very, very different. I think that's a that's easier, easier way of doing it. Some people who are extroverts can go anywhere and talk to anyone and can, you know, basically suck the energy or the ideas from people that they meet who are strangers. I'm not very good at doing that. And I suspect that, that not many people are actually. So I think that my way of doing it is just to have a friend who will make take me into new world, some new world, um, and do that in a way which uh, is palatable, and which may even be ultimately enjoyable. So now we've reached the point of one hour into our discussion, yes. <laughs> and I am flagging a little bit, so I'm going to <laughs> I'm going to terminate the discussion. And thank you very much indeed, Marks, for your ideas. And I hope that we'll be able to do this again at some stage in the future. And I hope that I'll have the opportunity to interview you. Give you some of your own medicine. I love that. Thank you, Richard. I appreciate you, buddy. Much love to you guys, and uh, we'll talk soon. Okay, very good. All the best. Bye-bye now. Cheers.